good afternoon or whatever it is where you are. Uh, my name is Mark Evanier. See? And uh, I have been doing cartoon voice panels for about 20 years at Comic-Con. Uh, I'm a mostly a writer, but occasionally I d direct the cartoon shows that I write, and I have a great time with cartoon voice people because, as it turns out, cartoon voice people are the funniest, nicest, most creative people you'll ever meet in the world, as these people will prove, or they'll be very embarrassed here. Uh, we're going to meet them, we're going to talk to them, we're going to do a reading for you. Let me introduce you to four of the best cartoon voice actors you'll hear today. Hello, cartoon voice actors. Hello, Hello, Mark. Hello Mark. Yeah. How are you? Thank you. I'm in box one. In box two is Misty Lee. In box How three is Mr. Bill, it's Mr. Bill Farmer. In box four is the lovely Lorraine Newman. In box five is the lovely Dee Bradley Baker. Thank you all for joining us from your home studios uh, where you are safe and isolating at this yes. time. Yes. Uh, I'm going to You're ask. Here in house arrest. I'm going to ask each of you to tell us what shows you've been on lately and do a couple of the voices you've done on those shows. But I will preface this by saying that cartoon voice actors are frequently under what they call NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. They've recorded something for a, a video game or a cartoon show that um, they, uh, oh, I'm looking for the wrong just here, thank you. Uh, they, that they are, that the, the producers do not want them to announce. They want the producers want to announce it themselves. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are under some form of not NDA? Show of hands. Okay, there you go. See, good. Uh, Misty, what cartoon yes. shows have we heard you on lately? Uh, lately, right now, airing on Nickelodeon is Lego City Adventures, on which I play Fire Chief Freya, who never has no time. And uh, we just did Jedi Fallen Order that came out in which I am the Night Sister. So that was a big video. Oh, game I love the Night Sister. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What else? What else have we heard you lately on? Oh, there's there's all kinds of stuff, but I'm afraid to tell you what's coming or what's been out because I don't know what's <laughs> what's out and what they can play. Okay, but, but like you were on the Spider Man show, I believe. Oh yeah, yes, I was okay. at May on Ultimate Spider Man and also Squirrel Girl on that show. Okay, what else? Got no. anything else? You can check your IMDb <laughs> listing if you'd like. It's all, it's oh well, that would have been nice instead That's of putting me up I'm first. Doing. there. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. I so everybody else can't remember anything. What have I, I done? Look, 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 look yourself up. Doing? Look yourself up okay. when we talk. To, we talk to Bill. Bill. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, people are waiting already for your most iconic voice that you've been doing. Would you favor us with? George, which one would that be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thirty-three years of doing that, and of course he's appearing on. Uh, you know, still Mickey Mouse Clubhouse is on since 2006, and it's still mm -hmm. on. Mickey and the Roadster Racers, Mickey's Mixed Up Adventures, mixed, Mickey, you know, uh, goes to Washington. Who knows what it is? But uh, anything with Disney and the Mickey Mouse shorts are in its fifth season. Also, I'm with Dee Baker, I'm glad to announce, uh, one that most people don't know about <laughs> Amphibia. And Dee plays our giant snail, Bessie, and I play a character named Hop Pop. And uh, so, and uh, probably the newest and most exciting thing, an on-camera role where I'm executive Ooh. producer of a show called It's a Dog's Life with Bill Farmer on Disney Plus. And Goofy and Pluto get to help out. And of course, oh, we can't forget okay. Pluto. Woo! So stepping out from behind the microphone to talk about real working dogs. That's wonderful. Cool. Bill, Bill, a lot of the goofy stuff you do, yes. I don't mean goofy, It's the stuff's goofy. I mean, goofy's <laughs> the character here. Uh, is stuff that we mean people would not hear because you do stuff for the parks, you do sure. stuff for industrial films, you yeah. do stuff for inter Disney projects. Um, oh yeah, um, for example, on uh, Mickey and the Roadster Racers and Mickey's Mix Up Adventures, I do a, you know probably about fifteen to twenty different characters over the run of that series. Oh. Where I'm the mayor, uh, Mr. Bigby, of course Pluto, uh, Horace Horse Collar. Uh, you know, what does Hor what, what does Horace Horse Collar sound like these days? Well, he first had a voice. I'm his original voice, really, in uh, Prince and the Pauper back around 1990. And wow. uh, I got to come up with a voice right on the spur of the moment. They said, well, he doesn't have a voice. And so we just had a little audition right there. 
I asked what was he like, and I said, he's kind of snooty, so, you know, kind of upper crust. So I was thinking Jim Backus. and But he's very droll, so I was thinking Ben Stein. Taylor. So I kind of mixed the two and came up with a voice that sounds like this. And uh, he's evolved over the years, but uh, that's sometimes you get to come up with a voice right on the spot. So it's a com- it's a combination of Jim Backus and Ben Stein. So he's yes. stranded on an island and he's bad at economics. Got it. Okay. Yes. All right. And he's boring that's, himself. that's a really great example of the kind of uh, alchemy that we do when we come up yes. with a character that y- you don't just pull something out of nothing. You, 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 you reference characters that you've seen or things that you've liked, and then you kind of mush them up a little bit and, and make your own little, little version of a, of a, of dough and yeah. that you cook up and make exactly. into this creature. Exactly. But it's, uh, and it's Hank cool Azaria, I think Hank Azaria said some of the characters he does came out of bad impressions. <laughs> so that they were so yeah. bad that they looked like original characters. <laughs> oh, absolutely. When I, I used to take classes in the beginning from Dawes Butler, and he said, he wow. said, I'm just a bad impressionist because Yogi Bear was an impression. Huckleberry Hound was a cousin of his. I mean, he would just do uh, uh, Captain Crunch was an impression. All of these characters that he did, he just did his spin on them, and they became characters in themselves. Huh. Well, a lot of that is Dawes's heart, though. I mean, Dawes yeah. had so much oh, to yeah. offer, and he imbued those characters with not just an original sound, but right. everything that Dawes was, and that yeah. warmth and that beauty came through. Yeah. Well, D- Dawes was amazing. I wanted to talk, I've got, I'm going to show you here. I, oh, this is, I was going to say this for later, but here's a photo that I found in June Foray's files that is to me very amazing. Oh my gosh. Oh, now, wow. Wow. now this oh my on the God. far on the far left is Joe Barbera. On the far right is Bill Hanna of the Hanna yeah. Barbera Studio. Mm-hmm. And everything you need to know about those gentlemen's relationship is is embodied in the way <laughs> in the way they are dressed. Joe Barbera <laughs> has just has just come from the network where he smooth talked them into buying a new show. And Bill Hanna has been working night and day in his shirt sleeves upstairs getting the cartoons produced and shipped off and getting the backgrounds, everything. It's amazing. Now, June is obviously the lady in yellow, mm-hmm. June Foray. Dawes is in the, in the center with his cane, yeah. uh, which he was had needed late in his life. The gentleman in the check shirt is Don Messick, right. who was a, a, the vo- original voice of Scooby-Doo, the original voice of Ranger Smith and Boo Boo, the voice of Papa Smurf and... An amazing, uh, a guy who doesn't get enough credit for how good a voice actor oh, yeah. he was. Yeah. The, gentle, the gentleman in the gray suit, anybody want to guess who that is? He's not a voice actor. That, who is that? Um, He's not a voice actor. <laughs> President okay? Eisenhower? No, you're close. <laughs> you're, you're, cl- you're close. You're close. Colonel that's, Sanders? Yeah. You get closer. MacArthur has returned. Uh, yeah. That's right. That's <laughs> Walt. No. That's Walter Lance, oh creator of Woody Woodpecker. Oh, wow. Woody Woodpecker, yeah. okay. That's right. And, they're, they're, <laughs> and they are and they are they are in uh, Joe Barbera's office, because I remember the Yogi Bear picture in the background and Joe's trophy case that you see on the left. And uh, uh, Dawes was just the sweetest, most wonderful guy you could ever meet. And his classes, which we've spoken of in past voice panels a lot, uh, were founts of creativity. You, it, Bill, didn't you find that when you were around Dawes, you felt more talented? Oh, yes. He brought, he would bring you up to his level. Well, I'd never get to that level, but he would bring you up and just, just, I listened to a, an old cassette tape I have of him about acting. Just uh, about three weeks ago, I was transferring some old uh, cassettes onto digital and I listened to it and it's, I wish I'd you know, had the wherewithal to understand really what he was saying way back then, because he was to say, he was saying that it's all about the acting. It's voice acting, not voice acting. That just if that character doesn't live within a, a, and have a life, a personality, a soul, it's just a hollow voice. Bob Bergen on one of these panels said Dawes was the first voice teacher he ever had who said the word acting. Yes. And he also said, uh, every character has a voice, but not every voice has character. Yeah, I love which that. I thought was a very wonderful. Oh, do you great. do you do a do- impression of Dawes? Are you the, well, are you the only uh, student of his yeah. that doesn't? Well, he uh, yeah, he kind of. It was almost like Captain Crunch a little bit. He was very <laughs> he was very kind of uh, uh, low key on the phone. He'd just say, you know, if you didn't have any money, which I certainly didn't when I came out here. Oh, don't don't worry about it. It's ten dollars, and come on over, and oh, we'll just uh, we'll read some scripts and have some fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll we'll t- we'll talk later about. 
what voice actors sometimes the, uh, are charging these days. Some of the worst ones oh, yeah. charge the most. Yeah. Let's talk about to Lorraine. Lorraine, what shows have we heard you on lately? <clears throat> okay. Uh, she said it's consulting me, IMDb. <laughs> don't ask me to remember the voices on some of these, but the most recent is Bob's Burgers. Um, and I played like this folk singer in hiding. Uh, Talking Tom and Friends, um, a, a nasty school teacher, uh, Hootsburg, Professor Hootsburg and Southwest Sal and Doc McStuffins, Harvey Girls Forever. I played a uh, chairman of Hainosis on She's a, a Total on um, Infinity Train. I don't even remember doing that show. Apple and Onion, I, I play Butter. My name is Butter. My character's name is Butter. Um, Tales of Arcadia, Summer Camp Island. I mean, those are, I'm, and I'm also doing a Netflix show right now. I just did an episode, I can't, which is I can't talk about, but I just did an episode of Tom and Jerry. Okay. And you were on uh, Hysteria. You were yes. on the, Gar the Garfield show. We kept yes. throwing, we kept oh, yeah. throwing impossible things at Lorraine on the Garfield show. She'd come in and it'd be like, well, "You want me to do that?" And it took her a long time to find the right voice. It took her about a minute and a half usually. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was so I was fun. there. I was so Lorraine fun. and I. You you were so amazing on that show, Lorraine. I was Thank there the you. day Frank Welker taught you how to roar like a lion. <laughs> <in the trench. laughs> well, I don't think I ever really accomplished it, but I do. Yes, you did. So yes, you did. Someone gave me a picture of me with the trash can next to my head and him next to me. That I, I value most of all. But, uh, that was, yeah. Mark, your show was so much fun to do. And it was really, it was like a buffet uh, for any character actor. It's like, oh, I get to do this and I get to do this. So well, we, had, we had a great cast. What happened with what Misty and Lorraine are talking about is we had an episode where Misty and Lorraine played uh, baby lions, small lions, and they had to roar at some point. And Frank does the greatest lion roars in the world. Although I think probably D could take them, take them on some days. But uh, <laughs> so during a break, Frank volunteered to teach Lorraine how to roar. And he said, do you mind putting your head in the trash can? And Lorraine <laughs> said, I'm an actor. <laughs> you know, that's a promotion, I guess. So, Enough said. So, so Frank showed how to use the wastebasket to create a little reverb in your voice, hold it at a certain angle, and he taught her there. And that's one of the, the recurring themes of these panels, which is that actors all help each other, and, they're, and you can already see they're fans of each other's and such. Lorraine, I want to ask you, uh, keeping with some of our theme here, uh, as long as I've known you, and I've known your career a long time. I first saw you at the Groundlings. You were around funny, witty people. You were surrounded. You were always working with a, a troop of really clever people. And you did that at, at the Groundlings. You did that on Saturday Night Live. You've done it since then with a bunch of projects. I was at one of your birthday parties. And I was the only person in that room who had never made me laugh. It was a wonderful crop oh of God. brilliantly talented people. Do you find that? Being at a cartoon voice session now, surrounded by people like this, like she's going to say no, is the same. <laughs> is the same thing. You're around very funny, witty. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I I really don't want this um, for. I don't want a record of my saying this, but here it goes. I mean, I love this work so much, and uh, I do it for nothing. Forget I ever said that, but okay. the point is that, you know, I love the voiceover community and they are some of the funniest people I've been around and I am a tough crowd. You know, I've been around a lot of funny people, sketch players, improvisers, stand-ups, you know, actors. Um, some of the funniest people ever are in voiceover. Okay. Dee, where, are we heard, where have we heard you lately? I know... Uh, one place is, go ahead. Where have I been? I've been, uh, uh, we're still doing American Dad. I'm Klaus, I'm Klaus the German fish on American Dad. Uh, did a little panel for that yesterday. Uh, I'm Rex and all the clones on Clone Wars, Star Wars the Clone Wars. Uh, I do a lot of a lot of stuff for the Star Wars universe. Um, most of it I'm a clone. Um, where was I? Um, Perch Perkins, Action News, and Squilliam on SpongeBob SquarePants. We're still making that, and that's that's a lot of fun. 
uh, we're uh, bringing back Phineas and Ferb, where I, I, I do the least amount of work for the most amount of money by just going, that's all I do in the show. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that's a reprint from years ago, even. So it's just, it's, it's, I'm so very lucky to have had that <laughs> role. Uh, there's a, there's a fun little show called Cleopatra in space, uh, in space for DreamWorks. And they let me do this really horrifically screechy character <laughs> called Dennis. And he talks like that. <laughs> and, and normally they don't let me make something that sounds so unpleasant. But here, Doug, the show creator, <laughs> God. And I just I, I, I love the extremity of that character so much because normally no one wants to hear it. It's so unpleasant. But to now, me, now, now like did, the, did the show did the show creator imagine a voice like that and ask you to do something? Or did you just look at the character and go, that's what he should sound like? Uh, well, yeah, more more of the latter there. I mean, generally, your job is to come up with something on the first swing that's irresistible. That's yeah. that's what you want to do something that you really love that's just that's so right for what they're looking for that they just have to say yes even if it's not quite what they were thinking of because sometimes they may have had an idea and sometimes they really don't know what what they're going to do at all they just have a drawing and kind of a an idea of maybe the status and how the comedy of that character works but they really don't know what the soul of that character is and that's what we do um you know like 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 with a lot of improv and live performing uh, comedian type people is you come up with something fun right there in the moment, uh, engaging the crowd on the other side of the glass. And, um, and, and that's what you want to do is to come up with something that's just immediately everyone loves and that you love. And, and then you just run with it. Isn't that what yeah. happened with you and Klaus D Did, didn't they want a different accent and you yeah. did something? Cause I, I thought I yeah. heard you say that one time yeah, Klaus, in an interview or something. Uh, Klaus and American Dad, they wanted that as a French fish. And I, I had to do it as German because I knew German. And I thought it was a, it was a, it, it was much funnier choice. And his uh, name is Klaus. I mean. Well, the name yeah. was originally Francois, but I read oh. it. In, yeah. I read it in German and yeah. I did added sprinkled in Germanisms because I speak German and I find German a hilarious language. Um, I, I know there was a couple of world wars, apparently, but but still. <laughs> It's an interesting language with uh, with a lot of with fun there, especially if it's like a sexy goldfish, you know, <laughs> or a horny goldfish. Not necessarily sexy, but horny. It's a horny goldfish. Sexy is subjective, man. All right. It's true. <laughs> That's true. That's, I'll, I'll give you it. that. Yes. I have to go look at my fish. Now, now did, I, did I miss your – was I not paying attention or have you not mentioned your Warner Brothers jobs? Oh, uh, let's see. Well, Warner Brothers, I did Daffy Duck yeah. once upon a time for a movie called Space Jam, which I worked with Bill on and, and a whole stable of really awesome people. And uh, that was a lot of fun to be to be Daffy Duck, to be to, to actually be that just sort of just chaos, but just sort of benevolent chaos. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's such it's such a treat to be uh, Daffy Duck. And, and that was kind of this big. Um, wild uh, swing over the plate that connected uh, when I was just starting out here in Los Angeles, and um, and it was it just it's just so fun to be to be Daffy Duck. We did we did a bunch of cartoons recently that I'm not sure that they were ever released or ever will be released. <laughs> and now uh, Eric Bowes is doing Daffy Duck. Uh, I think for the for the stuff that they're doing now. But you know, it's like everybody takes a swing at it, yeah. and you don't really. I mean, for me. You don't really I, I don't really feel ownership of any of these characters because I don't write them. I don't own them. Um, they're not mine. But I the stuff that I bring to it, that that's the part that I own. And plus, I'm getting a paycheck plus residuals so I can go cry on a cry on a bag of money if I have, you know, an issue with somebody else getting the role, which I don't. You know, it's like that. That's the way it goes. It's fine. OK, now now you get hired a lot D, to do vocal sound effects and, and yes. strange creature noises. Yes. Uh, I remember a session, Frank Welker came in one day and said to an afternoon session and said, I spent all morning, they had me making the sound of angry oatmeal. <laughs> all right. What, what has, what have you been stuck? What you've walked in, I'm sure you haven't answered this question. What is this, the weirdest thing people have ever asked you to make the sound of? The weirdest thing that I ever make a sound of is just a straight ahead human. I mean, that that's weird to me. <laughs> I mean, like at, like doing the clones in Clone Wars, I never, ever would have thought to cast me or to ask me to do that kind of a thing because I like doing the weird stuff. That feels yeah. natural to me that, that because 
mostly because of my uh, comedy and improv experience. Uh, plus, I'm not a trained actor, so I don't I don't have like a confined uh, version of what it is I want that I do or, or how I get attention. Maybe that's a better way to look at it. And so um, and so I'm very happy to step out and do something odd in order to get people to laugh or to nod their head or to say, yes, do more of that. <laughs> Exactly. So it's 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 hard to throw something at me where I feel uncomfortable unless it's just we want you to scream. The, I mean, that that I don't like to do. And that's no fun. And it you know burns out my voice quickly as it does for any of us, like in, in a video game, for instance. Mm -hmm. But other than that, it's 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 the weirder, the better. Well, let me let me try. Let me, let me try some categories here. Have you done flying insects of any sort? Wonderful. Um, right. Have they stuck you? My dogs they, are uh, perking up. I remember a couple of voice guys were do used to do like squeaky door hinges. Oh. Yeah. It's got, but it's got to have, it's got to have intent underneath it, right? Otherwise, yeah. they're just going to use a sound effect. So it's like. Well, I need a script though. I need to, I need to know what that door hinge thinks about what's going on. That's great. That's plenty. That's what's great. walking through that door? Okay, that's that's great stuff there. <laughs> Misty, have you thought of anything else on your resume you want to tell us about? Well, I brought my IMDb up in another window, so sure. <laughs> Um, I just uh, had a video game come out called The Last of Us Part Two, in which I played oh. the monster, which is the clickers. They, it's this really bizarre oh. uh, noise that they make. It's, um, and then they used it because they used tele, um, um, audio location. And uh, I was in TOTS, which is a show on Disney. I did a dolphin mom on that one. Lego City Adventures, I mentioned. Jedi Fallen Order. I just did a, a root mother who's a really old tree lady that's been obsessed by the root and they cut her free in a game called Remnant from the Ashes. And I play Kaver and a Gritsko! Um, and she's a happy maternal hippo, <laughs> as one does. Yeah, she's very sweet. You know what you do, is what she always tells people. And those are those are the recent ones that are that are airing and out right now. Okay, that's great. Now, the next category here I wanna ask you each about is voiceover jobs that we don't know you did, and this doesn't have to be a cartoon. In fact, it's better if it's not a cartoon. Someplace you use your voice for a commercial, a dubbing, a looping, a theme park ride or something like that. Bill, are you heard in, are you, heard, you heard in Disneyland a couple of places not as goofy, oh, yeah. right? Where, where um, else do we hear you in Disneyland? At uh, Disneyland, I've done announcers. I've done, but it's always been a voice. I haven't done uh, a sound effect or, a, you know. I know. A, we'll, we'll take voices. What, what, okay. what, what voice? Where is your voice heard in Disneyland? Um, well, you know, wherever Goofy is on the the parades and stuff like that. Of course, uh, we did a thing uh, several years ago called State Fair, where I was doing a Pat Buttram kind of announcer Aww. voice, <laughs> and that was a lot of fun. Oh, um, God. and, uh, a lot of them, usually it's in like, uh, uh, loop groups, which I've done several movies with Lorraine and, um, for example, probably the most obscure thing that you wouldn't know was, uh, in the mo movie Beauty and the Beast, where Gaston is singing about decorating with antlers and everything in the bar. He throws three up in the air and they go, <laughs> That's me. I'm eggs. So, you know, it's a very strange thing, but little sound effects like that and villagers attacking the castle and you never know. You never know. Okay. Misty, what, where, where have you, where are you going to heard that we don't know of? Um, some people don't know that I did the voice match for Princess Leia and, um, Star Wars Battlefront one and two, because, uh, you know, but I also got to do her in motion capture, which was rad. Mm -hmm. um, T tell our audience what it's like to do a voice in motion capture. What what do they physically put on you? 
Oh, wow. They put a ping pong ball suit on you. So they you have a, an 11 pound hat. Sometimes it depends on what the technology is that they're using. And they have a little camera that swings around the front and they put dots all over your face and they record only the dots. So if you're self-conscious, there's really no reason to be. You can really just play because they're going to lay a computer image over you. And what? so you'll wear a black suit sometimes with little dots, balls stuck on them with Velcro, or sometimes they put it on a different way. And you run around what they call a volume surrounded by cameras in 360 degrees. And they, every single, every single move, every swish, every gallop, anything you do, they record and they use that as animation for the video game. So that day that I got to do Princess Leia in motion capture, everywhere I ran in that volume, Carrie Fisher was going. <laughs> and it was amazing. I, I, and they're recording your voice at the same time live. Yeah, yeah, okay. they do. They yeah, they put a they put a, it. It depends. Sometimes they lay it down. When we did Night Sister, um, I was on the motion capture volume for that, but they had a big six foot four tall man, T.J. Storm, who's a stunt performer, doing all the big moves. So we both learned the choreography and we both did the blocking. And he was right behind me. They were recording both of our movements, but my face. And they put it, they combined them and put them in this monster that became this huge wow. Wow. Dawoodin woman. And because TJ Storm is, a, he's in the martial arts hall of fame. He's incredible. So as we're walking down a ramp, he's got the weight and, and we're both practicing the swagger. And he... <laughs> It was just amazing to watch someone who specializes in movement watch you. And here's this six foot four. I don't know how tall he actually is. He's maybe 100 feet tall. Uh, watches you and then picks up his purse and walks away. <laughs> it's just incredible that that he can put. And he's a trained actor. So he gets in there and uh, it just working together and becoming that hybrid and doing that was a very, very, very unique and really exciting experience because you're playing with people who have experiences you don't and you come up with something incredible and then they mesh it all and create this weird wacky hybrid and then so they got going back to your original question they got audio in the volume some of which they kept and then later on i went back and did some pickups to picture because they had changed some lines so now i'm i'm getting to watch that character hybrid that's half tj and half me do this and and then respond to that what they've animated with the new lines and that was a privilege it was it felt like a universal mulligan getting to go back and say oh i would deliver that a different way now's your chance give it to us six ways and <laughs> we'll pick which one we like I, best so. i think you can't really underestimate how much you learn from others as an actor <sighs> Absolutely. that you know it, it's good to take a class or it's good to read a book but ultimately it's it's the collaboration of creating things as a team essentially that's really where you learn. That's where I learn the most is to watch right. others who are either their own awesome thing or they're so much further ahead of me in their confidence and their access to their instrument and to derive inspiration and to learn from that and to see how they do that and to take that in. That, that's the for me is the greatest instruction of all is that well and you are so generous in a booth d that's something that you really do perpetuate oh, and move forward yeah you totally totally do you love actors you love acting and you listen so intently when other people are working around you and you are right in it with them and you are so present and you are, well, you're all I, I you're all such thanks. a joy to work with but you oh, really nice. are do you Likewise. really do are you? And then, oh yeah you, as, as are you but it's it's listening and collaboration that's the heart of it and, and really, that's what my improv experience really taught yeah. me. In addition to me doing too. plays and musicals, it's like, if you're not listening, you're not playing, you're not doing it. If you're not, you're in not it. honestly there and, and, and in a supporting role, no matter how big, how many words you're talking, <laughs> if you're there supporting it, that then you're playing it right. Yeah, and, and you that's can find what you do. Yeah, and you can find so many things. You'll deliver a line a completely different way because you were listening right. to what the other actor brought to it. Whereas you may have read through the script and heard it in your head one way, and then it comes out of your mouth something completely different because it's in response to what you were just given. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's Lorraine, so exciting. Lorraine, where else have we heard you in other things besides the kind of cartoons we were discussing? Well, so you child. said not to talk about cartoons, right? Well, something that nobody knows you did. Oh. I, I'm like the first voice you hear in Monsters, Inc. 
where the mother, they're seeing a demonstration of the kid being put to sleep. The monsters are watching us like an instructional video on how to scare. And uh, that's the first voice is like, you know, good night, honey. And then I'm a school teacher in that one too, where I'm, my, what an affectionate father. And uh, let's see, I mean, on Saturday Night Live, I did a lot of sound effects. I did like a, a baby when we did stunt baby and I did a, a puppy when we did stunt puppy, you know, um, of the dog being hurt, it was like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's, That's great. Baby. So right now, I mean, Bill, you need you need her on your show. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> you know. Um, stunt baby. Stunt That's baby. awesome. Stunt baby. <laughs> yes. Yeah, those were really uh, wonderful. Of course, none of us had kids and didn't realize how gruesome the idea was of throwing a baby around. Well, there's a lot of stuff on that show that wouldn't pass muster today. So yeah. anyway, um, uh, commercials, anything? Is there uh, anything else lately? Me? Oh, yeah, no. yes, you. Nothing? Okay. I mean, no, I, I, I did very few um, voiceover commercials. The one on-camera commercial I did was for Parker Brothers, um, the Guinness Book of Records. It was the first job I ever had. It was before the Groundlings had our name, you know, um, and it was the first thing I auditioned for, too. <clears throat> wow. That really set me on a course of unrealistic expectations. <laughs> I was just going to say, your first audition is your first job. Yeah. 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 Usually the people who get, yeah. usually the people who get the first thing they offer audition for never work again. It's like, <laughs> I know. You know, Kiss the, the person who got, who got the first a strike on their first bowling uh, yeah. Frame. Anyway, turkey right, right out of the gate. You know. Okay, I want to uh, get to the script now. If we would, oh, you, you would get, grab your scripts. We're going to do what's called a cold reading here. These people printed out their scripts this morning when I emailed them to them, but they have, on their honor, not read them. I am going to assign the roles, give them a couple minutes to look at over their scripts, and then I am going to. And while I do that, I'm going to do my little uh, pitch for not going to predator. Tory voice actors. Uh, you, we're going to do the script. The script we're going to do is Little Red Riding Hood. Misty, okay. you are the mother and you are the grandmother, and you have okay. most of the first page is a telephone conversation with yourself. Bill, you are going to be the uh, the the handsome woodsman and Alrighty. the wolf. D, you're mm -hmm. going to be the narrator, and I would mm -hmm. like you to do a different voice for every narration line. Imagine that you're. You know, I think there's 16 lines. You're 16 different narrators taking turns. Lorraine, okay. you are Little Red Riding Hood. Now, while we while these people are uh, looking over their scripts or marking them, whatever, I'm going to take myself full frame here. I always do this on our panels. Uh, one of the things that breaks my heart about this business is that there are people who are voice coaches and voice teachers who will take a lot of money from students and not deliver really results or careers. There are some wonderful voice teachers. We'll talk a little later with Bill because Bill's been teaching a lot. There's some wonderful, honest people. He'll, as he'll tell you, Dawes Butler charged very little for his class and would not take you unless he thought you had genuine potential. Mm -hmm. You had to audition to get into his class, and a lot of people didn't pass. But there are mm -hmm. folks out there who will take any amount of money you have, and they will, will give you um, the kind of advice you can actually get by looking at some of my panels or by going to D. Bradley Baker's website, we'll tell you about in a minute, which gives wonderful, helpful advice to the wannabe voice actor. You can, you can spend $5,000 on lessons and not learn as much as you can by spending a couple of hours reading D's site. Uh, just be cautious. Uh, there are a couple of cases where people have come to me and uh, parents, distraught parents, because they spent a lot of money buying lessons for their kids, and somehow their kid has not turned into uh, displacing Rob Paulson on all the jobs. <laughs> so um, that that's just, it's just, I, I, I we do, a, at, when there is an actual Comic-Con for us to go to, we do a panel there called The Business of Cartoon Voices, in which we try to dispense uh, very useful information to people who want to be voice actors. Misty used to come to those classes and uh, sit in I them and watch. Them. Yes, I would just audit it. I was like, I don't need to go in the booth. I just want to see what everybody else is doing. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, Misty would come to the classes and take notes. And then one day she was in the front of the class helping teach it. It was a very uh, <laughs> amazing uh, uh, transformation. Misty, Misty is one of those people who 
came into the voice business and just suddenly was working like crazy. So the business discovered her and she didn't no, have the a business didn't discover me. You gave me my first job and I will never forget okay, it. Okay. But I didn't give you your second <laughs> job. Okay. <laughs> That's fair. So anyway, Thanks. all right. Uh, we're going to do this now. This script, this little Red Riding Hood script, is a boring, stupid script. And if there's anything you hear anything funny in it, it's because the actors inserted it. Unlike normal voice no sessions, pressure. we allow you to play with the, change the lines. You also can change your voice anytime you like okay. because you're not okay. being paid, you're not being paid for this, so no one's going to withhold your check if you don't deliver a consistent performance. Okay. Uh, this is the story of Little Red Riding Hood. We will start with. The narrator, Mr. Baker, when you're ready. Once upon a time, there was a cute little girl who always wore a red riding hood. She wore it so often that everyone called her Little Red Riding Hood. One day, her mother was on the phone to her own mother, who was saying, <laughs> I've been feeling poorly for days now. <laughs> Will you just drink hot tea and try to stay in bed as long as you can? I'm sending Little Red Riding Hood over with a basket of goodies. <laughs> oh, bless you, my daughter. <laughs> but make sure she doesn't go through the dark woods. There are wolves who live there, you know. Nasty wolves with big, sharp teeth. <laughs> I'll tell her. Now. You go rest, Mother. I will, thank you. Goodbye! Little Red Riding Hood! Yes, Mother. Mm, your grandmother is feeling poorly, so I fixed her a nice basket of goodies, and I'd like you to take it to her. Sure, Mother. Is it okay if I take the route through the dark woods? Oh, Little Red Riding Hood, how many times have I told you never to venture into the dark woods? It's filled with wild animals and danger and even some wolves. Take the route around the lake. Then it takes so much longer. Mm -hmm. It's so much safer. Now, here you go. Grandmother's expecting you. Yes, Mother. So... She set out for grandmother's house <laughs> with her basket of goodies. And as she skipped along the path, she said to herself, I'm not afraid of wild animals of danger or even wolves. I'm going to take the route through the dark woods. She was just about to enter the dark woods when she happened to enter a pass. A handsome woodsman. Oh, yes, young lady. You don't want to go through there. <laughs> the dark woods aren't safe for a little girl like you. <laughs> well, thank you, handsome woodsman. But I'll be fine. I know how to take care of myself. I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> but... Little Red Riding Hood <laughs> didn't heed the warning. She went skipping her way into the dark wood. <laughs> <laughs> she was almost to the center of the dark wood when someone spotted her. And that someone was a mean looking wolf. Hey, where do you think you're going? I'm on my way to my grandma's house with this big bag of goodies. Goodies, huh? Let me have a look. No, these goodies are for grandma, They're not for the likes of you, you mangy wolf. Mangy wolf? Why, you little... He might have devoured little Red Riding Hood right there on the spot. But the wolf had another better idea. <laughs> oh, well. Your grandma's very fortunate to have a sweet little child like you, bringing her a whole basket of goodies. Uh, where'd you say your grandma lives? In a little cottage on the other side of the dark woods, right near the lake. I gotta go. Thanks, Mr. Wolf. Goodbye. She skipped merrily away, and once she was gone, the wolf took a shortcut and got to grandma's house before her. How is it? 
It's me! Uh, <clears throat> it's me, you sweet little granddaughter, <laughs> little red riding hood. Hey, let me unlock the door and let you in here, but uh, sounds like you got a call. <laughs> Before she could get away, oh, excuse me. <laughs> Before she could get away, the wolf tied to Grandma with a rope, tied a gag around her mouth, and locked her in the closet. <laughs> Then the wolf put on one of Grandma's old nighties and got into her bed, just as Little Red Riding Hood arrived. Come in! <coughs> Come in, dear sweet Riding Hood! Hi, Grandma. I brought you a whole basket full of goodies. <laughs> oh, how thoughtful of you, dear. Come closer. Closer. Why, Grandma? Your breath and what big eyes you have. Oh, 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 you flatter me. All the better to see you with, my dear. And Grandma, what big ears you have. I can't help it. Oh, all the better to hear you with, my dear. And uh, Grandma, and what, what big teeth you have. All the better <clears throat> to eat you with. <laughs> With that, the wolf leaped up from the bed and began chasing Little Red Riding Hood all around the room. Help. Help. Wolf. <laughs> Help. You're trapped. There's no way to get away from me. And just when it seemed like the wolf was right, well, an axe split from front door open and in came... You unhand that little girl, Wolf. The handsome woodsman chased the evil wolf far into the distance. And never come back. What did you do with my grandma? Let me out of here! Let me out of here! She's in the closet. They quickly got grandma out of the closet and untied her. <laughs> oh. I thought I was a goner. Thank you, handsome woodsman. We're so lucky you happened by. <laughs> well, when I saw the little lady here was going through the dark woods, I decided I'd better keep an eye on her. Mr. Woodsman, if I promise never to go in the dark woods again, will you please not tell my mother? <laughs> well, I guess you've learned your lesson. And she had. So they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> the end scene. Bravo. Bravo. Author, that'll be, be scale plus Thank 10, you. please. <laughs> it's a shame nobody has range, you know. Oh, <laughs> Paul Lind. Bill. Paul Lind. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, thank oh God! It's <laughs> fabulous. Oh, so yeah. funny. Oh, oh, Bill, so Bill, Bill had a, a decent career as an impressionist back yeah. in Texas, right? What, you, yes. who, what, what, what were your biggest impressions you were doing Beautiful. then? Oh, Johnny yeah. Carson, you did I Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson, exciting, exciting voice to do. Mm. Oh, that's so good. And uh, oh. of course, a lot of the old westerns I watched when I was a kid growing up. Yeah, what are you them sort of things? Oh. And I am, I am Jimmy Stewart. Well, and of course, John Wayne as well. So any of those old westerns were pretty good fodder. So, you know, just kind of come up with that. And I, Don Adams, I've got smart, which was, I think, the first voice I ever did to fool my friends. And, and uh, you know, as it got older, drive through Burger King and stuff and ordering. <laughs> That's and, great. You know. <laughs> one time, one time I was going through McDon the McDonald's on uh, La Brea and I realized Frank Welker was in the car behind me. Uh, picking up the order. And so I said to the cat, the uh, lady, I said, um, at the window, I said, the guy behind me, how much is his order? And she said, oh, it's uh, $4 and 50. And so I said, here, here's $4 and 50 cents for him. Tell him he can have his order for free if he makes duck sounds. And I drove <laughs> off. <laughs> and, and Frank pulls up. Oh my gosh. Anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, let me ask you all, we got time here to do a little more of these, these questions. Uh, I'd like you to name drop. 
tell us somebody you worked with you were really impressed to work with that you went into the session and then when you got home you couldn't wait to tell your partners or whoever today i worked with blank tell stan me freeberg yeah <laughs> stan, stan freeberg yeah yes definitely yeah. stan freeberg yeah. <laughs> because he's just, I'm sorry for interrupting you, Mark, but I was so excited. And that same day, Rosemary and June Foray were in the booth oh, and Lorraine was in the booth. You were there, Lorraine. Yes, I, I, I'm yes. looking around and going, what am I doing here other than learning? Like it was yeah. so exciting. Oh, I couldn't even breathe. Yeah. <gasps> and, and, I think, and I think you once drove Freeburg home from a session. Twice. 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 I got okay. alone time with Stan. And yeah. you know, it, it's really interesting when you're sitting with someone who's a true genius. Dee was just saying this earlier. Some of the best performers in the industry listen, they don't talk. They can say yeah, it, but they much true. rather listen to you. And I'm like, no, Stan, no, just talk the whole way home. And he's like, I know what happened to me. I don't know you. And I want to know about you. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not going to talk about me right now because you're brilliant. And this is my five minutes alone with you. Talk to I, me I, about canned tomatoes. I know? think it's an important it's an important point that to me, half of an actor's job is to listen. Yeah. Even mm -hmm. if you're even if you're talking. It's a it, it's a misstep when you audition, for instance, and you think, well, my job is just to read these words and actually no, you have to be listening while you're reading the words. You're listening to the environment, to who you're talking to. You're taking all of that in and that informs the reality of what you're bringing out. And so you're really a good part of what you're doing is you have to be listening. Very, mm -hmm. It's very important to improv and and comedy and and all acting but it's very important for voice acting very very absolutely. very absolutely and it's also uh, the nicest thing about voice acting and actors is that they're so supportive um the first celebrity i ever worked with and i was so excited was gary owens and we got oh. to share a microphone and we did an opening for an nbc show and i was doing goofy and he said the following program is brought to you in living color. And I said, and stereo on NBC. And just that one line. And he was so gracious. And hello, yeah. Bill. It's nice to work with Gar you. Gary and was a lovely man. He, Gary yeah. was a lovely man. Yeah. We went, He was in a Garfield session one time. Yeah. And mm -hmm. for some reason, we decided to have a Gary Owens sound alike contest. And it was oh. Gary... Frank Welker, Neil Ross, and Greg Berger oh all God. did their Gary Owens. Everybody oh did Gary Owens. Mine is Gary Owens. And then we got... We recorded it and got somebody from another session to come in and judge it. And Gary came in second. Neil Ross beat him. <laughs> <laughs> I love like, Neil Ross. Oh, oh my God. Anyway, no. but um, uh, Gary was a lovely. I, I this it, it's this was going to sound a little gruesome, but a lot of these people who I loved, I spoke at their funerals, and I and and I couldn't believe that I knew these people well enough. To sp I spoke at Gary's funeral and told a story which is way too long to tell her about how nice he was to me throughout my career at times when there was nothing in it for him. It was no, it was, he saw no, there are people in this business who will do you favors if they see a possible return. But Gary was just nice because that's who Gary was. Um, he was great. Uh, so uh, Lorraine, who have you worked with in voiceovers no, I, that really impressed you? Well, honest to God, um, all the people on this panel right now, uh, the first series I ever did was Frank Welker, June Foray, Maurice LaMarche, Rob Paulson, Jeff Bennett, um, uh, Billy West, uh, and then people like John DiMaggio and Fred Tattashore. Uh, all of these people, and I mentioned Tress, didn't I? I said Tress McGee. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, these are the people that, you know, I'm impressed when I work with them and they, they are stars. We know that they're stars, but for people who are not necessarily in our business, they don't know that these people are stars. So when I'm excited because I've met a star, it doesn't always, you know, when I tell people that don't know my world, our world, yeah. they don't quite see how fabulous it is. Wow. Before I ask Dee, I'm going to show another photo here. I just happen to have this here. This is a photo of a uh, rap party we had for the Garfield and Friends show, the first Garfield show I did. This was, I mean, this was like, I think the fourth season rap party. We the show went on after this, and we invited to the rap party everybody who had done voices on the show who had been on more than three times. We had to, we couldn't, we had a limit the number of people we could have at the party. This is the a photo that was taken there. 
Now, oh, Julie, let me see if oh, I can tell you who's on this. Wow. Starting from the left, the guy in the gray jacket is Greg Berger, who's yeah, been on our yeah. voice panels. The fellow behind him is Tom Hughey, who was the original voice of John, who's now retired from the business. Next to Tom directly is uh, Ju Julie, uh, Payne. Julie Payne. Yeah. Uh, below Julie yeah. Payne is June Ferre. Mm -hmm. The guy with the mustache is Frank Welker back yeah. then. Oh, uh, then next below Frank is Howard Morris, who people remember as yeah. as Uncle what? Goopy and, and oh Ernest and Ernest T. Bass and and Sid Caesar's sidekick and Adam Jesus. Ant and one of the like greatest people I ever had the pleasure to know. Like next to Howie is Susan Silo, who mm -hmm. I also love dearly from voice people. In the back there's Chuck McCann. Uh -huh. In front of Chuck is Tress McNeil. Yeah. Then next to Chuck is Gary Owens. In front of Gary is Neil Ross, who we just mentioned. Next to, to the to the right there is Stan Freeberg. Mm -hmm. In the front row, that's Jim Davis in the in the in the maroon tie, whatever that color is. <laughs> Me and the guy with the coffee cup is Lorenzo Music. Wow. And wow. and we and also oh, at this at this party, they didn't get in the shop, but we had Paul Winchell mm -hmm. And Greg Burson, who somehow were in the men's room or something when they yeah. took this photo. Uh, just an uh, amazing array of people there. Uh, no, Dee, who have you worked with who impressed the hell out of you? You, you know, generally, I, I, I try to look at uh, even the stars that we get to work with as we're, we're all part of, we're all session players, you know, like yeah. a wrecking crew that's brought in. Exactly. And, and we're there to make, to do the best that we can, but it's a collaborative thing and, and no one gets more credit than anybody else and everybody shines. Um, but I got to say the, the one time for me when I, I got to do a series and it was a terrible series, I must say, which actually he would, he would freely admit was Mel Brooks. Oh and and to, oh, it wow. was Space Jam, the series, not Space Jam, Space Balls, excuse me the series and I was dark helmet to his, I can't remember his character, but, but to sit there and have him to, to work with him and, 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 and with the, the legacy and the heart and the humanity that he has and, and the funny that he brings that reaches uh, so far back and he still got it. Um, it. And to have him sit there and look at me and he told me a joke one day and just it's it's one of the most delightful things I've oh, ever experienced God. in my life because I just so admire the heart and humanity and the staying power of of a fellow like that. It is just it really just it gives me goosebumps to talk about it. Good people. Lorraine, yeah. who's the funniest person you ever met in your life? Made you laugh the most. Oh, my God. I can't name one person. I really can't name three. Uh, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, and Keegan Michael Key. Okay, that's a pretty impressive list. Anybody else got a list like that? Christy, who's Everybody. the funniest person you ever met? Are you asking me? Who's the yeah, funniest yeah, person? Yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody I, mean, yeah. Yeah, no, everybody I meet is funny in some way. Yeah, yeah. Everybody I meet is funny in some way. They've got their own unique personality quirk, and they, and there's always something that we can find common ground on and laugh with. So I'm I, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> All right, yeah. Bill, D, you don't have to answer. Oh, yeah. You don't want to. Well, just no. a... um, I did five years of stand-up, so I got to be around a lot of the headliners and watch them. In the early days, Tim Allen, Jay Leno, uh, mm. I mean, all of wow. those guys. I got to say, way back about 1983 or four, I saw Jay Leno back in Dallas. We went to a show of his. He was doing some stuff there. And I think it was probably the, the funniest show i've ever seen in my life it i mean he was on he was a great night. stand up he was an amazing yeah. stand up when he was doing all his a-list materials and i know. saw him at the comedy yeah. store in the 70s when he had long black hair yeah and he did an elvis impression where he gathered all of his hair into a ponytail like this and just did this <laughs> <'Cause> the, <laughs> no words just the look and the pompadour it was so great. And he had another joke, which was, uh, you know, you eat at McDonald's, you go home, you take a shower, you wash your hair, you brush your teeth, you put on deodorant, maybe you put on cologne, then you go out and someone says, hey, did you eat at McDonald's? <laughs> I, was, I was around the comedy store a lot in those days, and I remember uh, Leno following Richard Pryor and topping yeah. him. Wow. He, was, really? he was hysterically that, funny. Yeah, the two, the two funny people. I tell people the two funniest stand-up acts I ever saw. I saw 
you know, in his prime. He's still damn good out at the Comedy and Magic Club. And I saw the last stand-up act, I think, ever that Albert Brooks did. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Who, was, wow. who, was, who was indecently funny. Yeah. It was amazing. And he all he did was just stand on stage and tell stories about his career. It was, it was <laughs> all he has to do. Well, anyway, um, we're going to wind this down here in a minute here. Uh, I would like to go around and tell you that these people are all on social media different ways. Dee, I was talking earlier about your website, uh, www.iwantobeavoiceactor.com. Is that I want right? www.iwantobeavoiceactor.com. It's free. It's everything. I'm a very long-winded person, and I... I, I <laughs> And but I, I'm you know we're all asked that what do you how do you get into voice acting I want to be a voice actor and so I I started making a website about it because I yeah. I think I was tired of of doing the uh, two hour uh, dissertation of of what I thought about it and so it's there and I just keep putting new information on there I've got a lot of new stuff now about building a home studio I've I've, I've just built this one in a closet that I'm in right now mm -hmm. um, looks and, great. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it it's functional. You know, it works. It, it keeps the it keeps the machine running. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to be a voice actor dot com. It's free, and um, it's uh, anybody who's interested in becoming an actor or or a voice actor, uh, check it out. It's uh, it's not the only resource out there, but it's free, <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's everything I can think of, and hopefully it's of use. You can be a better teacher. Good. And the, yeah. these are the other places people can reach you on social media. Yeah. Uh, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, but uh, and, and don't pester this man to listen to your demo, but read everything he says on that website. It's a it's a wonderful <laughs> website. All right. Uh, let's go to um, uh, Lorraine here. You're on. Uh, there you are. There you are. That's your you are on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, I also do have a website, but I have not kept up with it. But it's fun. It has a lot of my essays and they're fun. Oh, but that's just LorraineNewman.com. LorraineNewman.com. Okay. Oh, Good. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to Bill here. Bill, um, you're at you're Goofy Bill on Twitter yeah. and Instagram and Tune House. Time. Now, are you teaching these days? Yes, I am. Yeah, All and right. also producing demos. My son's an audio engineer and uh, got a good. And we've uh, done really well with that. Uh, uh, that would be a good place to go. I have BillFarmer.com, which, again, the guy that was running the website left, so I haven't updated it in forever, but, you know, you can check it out. Uh, uh, Tune House is probably the best one to get in touch with me. The, there are, as we said, uh, I said earlier, there are a lot of good voice coaches around, but when you mm. get somebody who is actively working, who you know? Who who is who is not a, a voice voice coach exclusively? It's an adjunct to his main income. Actually doing voices, you're pretty in pretty safe shape. Like Charlie Adler or Bob Berg. Yes. There's other people. Uh, David Sobolov, I know, is teaching now. Steve Bloom. Uh, uh, Steve Bloom. Yeah, Steve Bloom. Uh, mm -hmm. J. P. Yeah. Kerouac. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's a uh, there's a lot of people who are teaching now. Who you uh, and they're not the only good ones in the world, but you're safer with them than you frequently are with uh, some of the other yeah. people out there. And let's go to, I thought I clicked the right thing here. Misty, you are oh, on darling. Twitter. You are on Instagram, Magical Misty Lee. Uh, we have not even mentioned that Misty is an accomplished magician and what? that she, she has another really? career as a as one of the great magicians who's working these days. Uh -huh. Sleight of hand or, so cool. or illusion? I you can see every Wednesday we put up, well, we're on hiatus right now, but we'll be back soon. It's uh, unicornwednesday.com. We put up little magic tricks every week for kids and families. Wow. Yeah, uh, Unicorn awesome. Wednesday. I, I, have seen yeah. Misty for, I have seen Misty do magic many times. In fact, if you, yeah. call the ma if you call the Magic Castle, the voice that answers the phone is Misty Lee. And most of, the, most of the magicians will talk dirty to the recorded Misty Lee. <laughs> because That's gross. It's, nope. uh, it, don't get that on me, Evan here. I don't want okay. it on me. <laughs> don't even suggest it. Don't give anybody ideas. All right. I know most of those boys, and I don't want that on me. Thank okay, you. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> uh -uh. Anyway, and, and I am reachable <laughs> at uh, um, uh, newsfromme.com. This is my web blog, and it's where I announce – more webcasts I do and things like that. I have been doing this since December of 2000. So there are more messages on that blog that you and you could ever hope to read. Uh, and uh, can I just uh, say one thing, Mark? Sure. And I'm sure everybody can agree. This man, Mark Evanier, has given me some of the greatest jobs ever. I haven't had to audition, and um, 
He's a great writer. He's a great director. He's one of the best rock on tours I have ever known. Um, and he's loyal and supportive. And he's responsible for a lot of great experiences I've had just working for him. So yep. I wanted me that too. Oh, thank you. And well, he also you. has given me some of the best advice out of my career ever. He taught me how to be a good manager with one piece of advice. Two, well, he gave me two. One is for better living. Crazy people can't hurt you, but they can make you hurt yourself. But the other one is something that has carried through my entire career, whether I'm the boss or an employee, which is hire the best people for the job and get out of their way. Right. And it yeah, is well, some of the best advice I have been given in my entire life, Mark. And I thank you for that. Well, you know, actually, uh, one of the great, I believe in voice, in voice directing, the secret of voice directing is casting. If you if you have to give the actor a lot of direction, you've hired the wrong actor. And if you have <laughs> hired the wrong actor, you're not a very good director. It's so, like jazz, right? It's like, uh, a, it's yeah. like combo jazz. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but um, you know, you have if you have people like this in your session, how bad can how, even I can't muck it up? A rhesus monkey can direct the session when you have That's very good true. people in it. Uh, <laughs> and I believe Dean does a rhesus monkey very well. <laughs> 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 and, that, and, that actually, and that actually is a rhesus monkey, not some old. Anybody else would just do a monkey. D does right. a rhesus monkey, very good. Specifically, uh, and that was a rhesus. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you all for being here. Thank you for this uh, time. And uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Mark. Thank you for thank having you. us. Yes, so good. Fun. And thank really. you all for tuning in for this. Uh, we're going to end this now. From Bye. Home. Bye.